Catherine Knight is an Australian murderer and the first woman in the country to be sentenced to spend the rest of her life in prison. She was a domestic abuser who emotionally, physically and psychologically victimised all of her partners and our last victim, John Price, was subject to violence and threats of murder before his horrific death. In the early hours of the 1st of March 2000, Catherine Knight stabbed John Price to death, skinned and butchered him, cooked his body parts with her intending to feed them to his children. Welcome to Evil Among Us. Catherine Mary Knight was born on the 24th of October 1955 in the town of Tenterfield in New South Wales in the southeast of Australia. She was born into an extremely dysfunctional household characterised by serious violence, alcohol abuse, adulterous behaviour and exposure to issues that no child should have to see. Specifically, Knight's father, Ken Knight, was a violent alcoholic who would rape Barbara, her mother, up to ten times a day. He would also violently assault her. Barbara, in turn, often told her daughters intimate details of her sex life and how much she hated having sex with men. Later, when Knight herself complained to her mother that one of her partners wanted her to take part in a sex act she did not want to perform, Barbara told her to quote, put up with it and stop complaining. Knight also stated that, from early childhood until she was around 11 years old, she was sexually abused by various male members of the family. This appears to have been widely known, but no one did anything to stop it. While psychopaths tend to embellish stories about their childhood, Knight's claims have been supported by her siblings, who also had to endure this brutal upbringing. As with other children who grow up in similar environments being exposed to horrific behaviour and having no escape and no one to talk to, Knight internalised everything and was described as a quiet, withdrawn girl who had few friends and tended to keep to herself. There seemed to be two sides of Knight. The first was a model student who got awards for her good behaviour. The other was a bully who had extreme bouts of explosive rage who would victimise younger children, particularly boys and would often get into physical fights and attack people with weapons. On one occasion, a teacher had to fend off an attack from her. No doubt these outbursts were a tiny reflection of unresolved trauma she had experienced from watching and being the victim of acts of abuse, and her actions were an indicator of how her early years had shaped her attitudes and beliefs, with her perceiving that violence was a way to dominate and control others. Relationships were not partnerships, but a power struggle, and that men were to be hated and deserved to be abused. Knight left school illiterate and began working as a cloth cutter in a clothing factory. However, she soon found a profession which she described as her quote, dream job. This was working at a local abattoir where she began by cutting up bits of offal to then being trained as a butcher. She was extremely skilled in this work and seemed to have a passion for it. However, she seemed to take a morbid fascination in her work and would often stand watching while the pigs came through the production line and were killed. She had a set of professional butcher's knives for work and she would hang these above her bed everywhere she lived all through the years that she was free. This must have looked terrifying for someone who wasn't expecting it. Walking into a room and seeing the bed adorned with huge knives capable of slicing through flesh and bone. As she grew up, Knight's violent behaviour became more frequent and serious and she would often get into bar fights and even stir up trouble in order to get into physical altercations. She would also frequently suggest knife fights with people that upset her and generally seem to revel in extreme violence. If Knight's violence towards others wasn't bad enough, her behaviour towards the men that she was in a relationship with was nothing short of sadistic. One of the men that Catherine Knight began a relationship with was David Stanford Kellett, a co-worker at the abattoir with their meeting in 1973 when she was 18 years old. He's described as a man who liked to drink and the pair would frequently get into bar fights with Knight willingly getting involved with fists flying. In 1974, the pair got married and Kellett recalls Barbara, Knight's mother, saying the following at the ceremony, quote, you better watch this one or she'll fucking kill you. Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're fucked. Don't ever think of playing up on her. She'll fucking kill you. That's just what you want to hear on your wedding day. The happiest day of your life. But Barbara was right. Knight was a monster. 
and Kellett was lucky to survive their 10 year marriage. On their wedding night, Kellett was strangled by his new bride because he didn't perform to her standards sexually. This was a sign of things to come. In early 1976, Kellett returned home one night late from a darts match, only to find that Knight had set fire to all of his clothes and shoes. She then took a frying pan and smashed him around the head. Kellett fled to the neighbour's house, where he collapsed. He had to go to hospital to receive treatment for a fractured skull. During this incident, Knight was heavily pregnant with the pair's first child and was able to use this to emotionally manipulate Kellett to make him think that her outburst was hormonal and this persuaded him not to press charges. The pair's daughter, Melissa, was born soon after this incident, but the violence continued and in May 1976, Kellett left Knight, fleeing the domestic abuse he was suffering by moving to Queensland. A few days later, Knight was seen pushing Melissa in her pram, violently throwing the pram from side to side, clearly taking her anger out on the child. She was then admitted to St Elmo's Hospital in Tamworth, suffering from postnatal depression, and she spent a few weeks recovering there. When she was released, it seems like she had some sort of psychotic break, and after placing two-month-old Melissa on some railway tracks, Knight took an axe and went into town and began threatening to kill several people. Melissa was saved from the tracks by a homeless man and Knight was arrested and returned to hospital. But, bizarrely, she was not charged with anything and not sectioned. It seems she was in the hospital voluntarily and so signed herself out the next day. Within 72 hours, Knight had slashed the face of a woman and demanded that she drive her to Queensland to find Kellett. This woman was able to escape at a service station and Knight then took a young child hostage, holding a knife to his throat. She was eventually arrested by police, but she didn't go down easy, and fought them with all of her might. Knight ended up in psychiatric care again, and disclosed that, had she got to Queensland, she would have killed Kellett and his mother. David Kellett, likely feeling some sort of guilt or loyalty, moved back to the area after leaving his new girlfriend, and, when Knight was released from hospital on the 9th of August 1976, having only spent a matter of weeks getting treatment, she came to live with him. However, it was like returning to the lion's den, and Knight's behaviour became more extreme and unpredictable. Knight would call others, ranting about Kellett, stating she knew he was having affairs. Kellett worked various jobs, and this included being a delivery driver. One day, after coming home from his job, he was awoken by Knight straddling him, holding a knife to his jugular. She said, quote, Is it true that truck drivers have a woman in every fucking town? Is it? You see how easy it is, Kellett? I could do you right here. Kellett later said in an interview, quote, I had to talk fast, I can tell you. I was sweating and shaking. I couldn't even push her off. She had one arm across my chest and a knife into my neck. I thought I was gone. I was shit scared. It was the most horrific memory I have. Kellett was continuously abused. A knight would often randomly swing at his head for absolutely no reason and she was fully capable of knocking him out. Her diminutive appearance hid an unusually high amount of strength when she was in a rage, which was often. The pair had another daughter in 1980, but then, one day in 1984, Kellett came home from three days working away and he found the house had been cleared out and Knight and the children were gone. She'd left him without any warning or explanation. David Kellett was clearly bemused by this, but when he realised he was free, he promptly went out and got very, very drunk to celebrate. However, Kellett wished to see his daughters, but they were merely pawns tonight, a way to cause him further emotional pain. Kellett would try and see the children and take them on holiday, but Knight would always come up with an excuse. One daughter he did not see for 10 years, and when he did see her, it became clear that Knight had been poisoning his daughter's mind against him, making claims of abuse. His daughter said, quote, Mom reckons your dick needs to be cut off, Dad. By 1986, Catherine Knight had found her next victim, sorry I mean partner, and this time it was 38 year old miner David Saunders. Within months, Saunders moved in with Knight, but kept hold of his flat, a sensible idea as it gave him somewhere to escape to. After only two months, Knight's mask slipped and she began abusing Saunders. She was paranoid and extremely jealous. She would spend all of her time with Saunders and, when she wasn't around him, would create scenarios in her head where he'd be sleeping with other women. When he got home, 
she would confront him and accuse him of having affairs. And if she ever found out he was spending time with a woman, even on a casual basis, this woman would be the focus of her paranoia and rage. Knight would continuously claim that she was pregnant in order to gain sympathy from others. She would accuse Saunders of cheating on her and that this was particularly heinous as she was pregnant, which she wasn't. Later, Knight would repeatedly call the police on Saunders and go to the hospital and make claims that he'd been beating her and she thought she was pregnant. This never turned out to be true and hospital staff became used to her lies but would have to treat her injuries even though they didn't match the type of violence she was talking about. David Saunders would frequently flee to his flat and it was here that Knight would go searching for him, going to the property and then driving the streets and going to bars looking for him. In May 1987, the pair had a blazing argument and this spilled into the kitchen. Knight grabbed a knife and ran towards Saunders. He thought he was going to be stabbed, but she ran past him and into the backyard. She then picked up Saunders' dingo pup, aged only two months old, and slit the animal's throat. It seems Saunders did not see this brutal act, but came into the backyard to see Knight holding the pup, which had a gaping wound in its neck, with blood everywhere. This act was apparently to show Saunders the consequences of daring to leave her or cheat on her. However, Saunders found himself drawn to Knight and kept returning, where he would suffer repeated violent abuse. He was seen by his co-workers frequently with knife wounds and bruises on his body, and, on some occasions, they would stitch up his wounds. In June 1988, the pair had a daughter, Knight's third child, and Saunders decided the family needed more space, and so he put a deposit on a house. Knight had suffered an injury at work in 1986, and so, after 15 years of working as an abattoir, she was now unemployed, but she was given a sizable amount of compensation. She used this money to decorate the house, and her choice of decor showed her morbid fascination with violence and death. Every inch of the walls and ceiling was adorned with machetes, rakes, pitchforks, animal skulls, animal skins, and rusty animal traps. Knight also collected a sizable number of violent and horror movies, which she would spend much of her day watching. In 1989, the violence David Saunders was subjected to became more extreme, and it was one incident which was the final straw for him. During an argument, Knight accused him of cheating for the thousandth time, and then hit him in the head with an iron, and stabbed him in the stomach with a pair of scissors. Saunders moved back to his apartment, and returned only briefly to collect his belongings, finding that Knight had cut up all of his clothes. He then went to ground, staying with friends who were sworn to secrecy and they denied knowing where he was when Knight inevitably came searching for him. Several months later, Saunders returned as he wanted to see his daughter. He found out that Knight had gone to the police and claimed that she was the victim of abuse from him and so he'd been issued with a restraining order which stopped him from having contact with Knight or their daughter. Sickeningly, Knight had also told this child their father was dead. Between 1990 and 1993, Catherine Knight was in a relationship with a man called John Chillingworth, a 43-year-old former abattoir worker. The pair had a son in 1991. Chillingworth doesn't appear to have suffered anywhere near the same level of abuse as her other victims, and this seems, from what I've read, due to him being physically much stronger than Knight, and he would stand up to her. It seems that Knight thought this man was not someone that she could control, and so began having affairs. In 1993, she began an affair with a man called John Price, who, unfortunately, would not survive his relationship with Catherine Knight. John Charles Thomas Price was born on the 4th of April 1955, and, despite having little schooling, was a hard worker, but also a hard playing man. He had been driving machinery since he was a child, and spent almost 20 years as a miner, he was known as a likeable man, whose ability to consume alcohol was legendary in the local area. Price had three children from his marriage to a woman called Colleen, but they had separated in 1988, with two of the children living with him, and the third living with Colleen, but they would regularly visit. Price had no interest in getting married again, but was lonely, and wanted a woman to come home to. In late 1993, he met Catherine Nice at a bar, and was smitten. Soon afterwards, Knight and her children moved in with Price and his. However, within months, Knight began showing her true colours 
This became worse as she began to drink more when spending time with Price, which seemed to make her behaviour even worse. The pair would have frequent violent arguments where Knight would attack Price, sometimes with fists, but other times with knives. Her sexual jealousy was an ever-present feature of the relationship, and she once told a friend, quote, If I ever catch Pricey playing up on me, I told him I'd kill him and cut his dick and balls off. Knight was obsessed with marrying Price, but he had no interest, and was concerned this was her way of trying to get a hold over him and his property. No doubt this was true. Their arguments would frequently revolve around his unwillingness to marry her, and, in 1988, after being refused again, Knight took a video camera and made a video of items that Price had taken from his place of work. She then sent this to his boss, and, as a result, Price lost his job in the mines, which he'd had for 17 years. Price was furious and kicked Knight out, but she always found a way to worm her way back into the property. Catherine Knight also tries to divide and conquer the family, inevitably seeing John Price's children as being a barrier to having ultimate control in the property. With one of the children, Knight told her she was adopted and that Price was not her real father. This devastated the child and, whilst they were told this was a lie by Price and Colleen, Knight would continue to repeat this lie over and over again, chipping away at this child's self-esteem and trust in their father. Because of this behaviour, Price kicked Knight out, but this was short-lived and she was soon back. Friends saw Knight's unstable behaviour up close, including one day when she was sweeping and Price grabbed her bottom in a playful way. Knight exploded and berated him for treating her, quote, like a slut, before just as quickly, acting as though nothing had happened, and going back to her sweeping. Throughout the relationship, but especially in 1998 and the beginning of 1999, Price was seen by colleagues with more and more wounds, and would frequently show them knife wounds to his chest when Knight had stabbed him during an argument. In February 2000, Price was subjected to a series of serious assaults, including being stabbed in the chest, and he'd finally had enough of Knight and kicked her out of the house for the last time. In retaliation, Knight had gone to the police and made various claims against him. On the 29th of February 2000, John Price stopped at Scone Magistrates Court on his way to work to take out a restraining order to keep Knight away from him and his children. When he went to work, he told his workmates what he was doing and they begged him to stay with them rather than returning home. Price left work that day, telling his friends that if he did not turn up for work the next day, then he'd been murdered by Catherine Knight. Unfortunately, Price's comments would come true that very night. What John Price did not know was that Catherine Knight had already decided to kill him. How dare he not suffer her abuse without complaint how dare he kick her out onto the street? In Knight's mind, she could do no wrong. It was the men in her life who were always to blame. Price was trying to break free of her control. He deserved to die. On the 29th of February 2000, she began to put her plan in motion, collecting her butcher's knives, which had been freshly sharpened, and bought some new lingerie. Price went out that night and came back at 11pm and got into bed. He was awoken by Knight, who let herself in and unknown to him hidden a boning knife next to the bed. She was also wearing the new lingerie that she'd just purchased. The pair had sex, and Price appears to have fallen back asleep. At some point in the early hours of the 1st of March 2000, Catherine Knight began stabbing John Price. He quickly woke up, and, running on adrenaline, tried to escape the house. He ran out of the bedroom, and Knight pursued him, and continuously stabbed him. She aimed at his chest, trying to pierce his major organs, an arterial spray covered the walls and floor as Price tried to make it to the front door. The attack was frenzied and, by the time he got to the front door, John Price had been stabbed approximately 30 times. He managed to make it out of the front door but was dragged back in by Knight who carried on stabbing him again and again and again. Finally, after being stabbed 37 times, John Price passed away. However, if the nature of his death was not bad enough, what happened next is almost beyond belief. In order to frame the horror in this case, I'll present the scene as police officers discovered it. They were called at around 6am when Price's workmates, due to concerns that he'd not turn up to work, came to his house and saw blood on the door. At around 8am, officers entered the property 
and found blood everywhere, soaked in the floor and splattered all over the walls. On the left immediately past the front door was the lounge and here they found John Price's body propped up with his legs crossed, with his left arm slumped over an empty drinks bottle. However, Price had been decapitated and his corpse had been skinned. Between the lounge and the kitchen was an archway and officers saw what they thought was some kind of fabric covering the opening. When they got closer, they realised to their horror they were staring at the skin of a human being, John Price's skin, which was hanging from a hook. At her eventual trial, the judge described the skinning of Price, stating that, quote, it was carried out with considerable expertise and an obviously steady hand, so that his skin, including that of the head, face, nose, ears, neck, torso, genital organs and legs was removed so as to form one pelt. So expertly was it done, after post-mortem examination, the skin was able to be re-sewn on Price's body in a way which indicated a clear and appropriate, albeit grisly, methodology. Moving into the kitchen, the true evil of Catherine Knight was uncovered. On the hob was what the judge called a quote, sickening stew, with John Price's head simmering on the stove in a pot containing vegetables. On the table were two meals which included meat and vegetables. This meat had been taken from Price's buttocks and cooked in the oven. Beside each meal was a card with the names of Price's children on them. This sick monster was intending to feed John Price to his own children. Outside the property was found the remains of a third meal, which was apparently thrown out of the window. It's been speculated, but never concluded, that Knight had made this meal, eaten some of Price's body, found it unpalatable, and thrown it away. On top of a photograph of Price was a handwritten, poorly spelt note written by Knight, which stated, Time got you back, Jonathan, for raping my daughter. This was a lie. Price had never harmed any of Knight's children. The murder weapon, a large boning knife, was found at the scene. Police knew who had committed the crime and quickly tracked down Catherine Knight. I've read various sources which suggest she was found at a separate location, having left the scene, but others stating that she was in the same property with Price's body. Wherever she was found, Knight had taken an overdose, but it doesn't appear this was a particularly serious attempt to end her life. It was likely a tactic to try and gain sympathy for the police, despite the horror of her actions. Knight was taken to hospital, but quickly recovered and was interviewed by the police while still a patient. As shown by this clip, Knight claimed not to remember anything of the night she butchered John Price, but did remember an incident where she had stabbed him. But, notice her language when describing it. It was an accident, and only because Price had been aggressive to her. Once Price got off the phone, he started on me, and I was around washing up, and it could have been a fork, a spoon, or anything in my hand. It was a knife that cut your meal with, and I aimed it at him, and it got him. He was leaning closer than what I thought, and my eyesight was bad at that time. I've only had new glasses since then. Despite Catherine Knight claiming she couldn't remember anything, the evidence against her was overwhelming, and she was charged with the murder of John Price. Once she'd been discharged from the hospital, Catherine Knight was remanded into Silverwater Correctional Complex, a maximum security women's prison just outside Sydney. She was notorious in the prison before she'd even arrived, due to the publicity about her crimes. People were surprised, both staff and inmates, that this small, quiet woman could be responsible for such horror. Knight seemed to thrive in prison. She told family members that she loved life inside and that this was the first time that people were paying attention to her and taking care of her. However, Knight was incapable of not working some sort of angle and she would tell everyone and anyone how much of a monster John Price was and how she was the innocent victim, although she could not remember killing and skinning him. However, there's a difference between manipulating others in prison and facing an overwhelming mountain of evidence in court, and this was the challenge facing Knight when court proceedings started on the 2nd of February 2001. She offered to plead to the charge of manslaughter, basically, in her case, claiming that she'd killed Price, but this was not premeditated and apparently something she couldn't remember doing. This was rejected, 
and her trial for murder was set for July 2001 before being pushed back to the 15th of October 2001. In the months before the trial, Catherine Knight was assessed by various psychiatrists for the defence and the prosecution, and whilst there were some similarities in their assessments, there were obviously substantial disagreements. There seemed to be an agreement that Knight was of borderline low intelligence, but, as stated by an individual who met her, seemed to live her life off quote, rat cunning, which I believe is trying to imply some sort of innate skills in finding opportunities and exploiting them, scurrying around from place to place, manipulating and abusing others to get what she wanted. They also noted that she had chronic low self-esteem, shyness, difficulty coping with the end of relationships, unstable emotions, difficulty controlling her anger, anxiety when re-experiencing childhood abuse, continued fear of being raped and of her children being sexually abused, as well as avoidance when talking about her own experiences of abuse as a child. The consensus was that Knight was suffering from borderline personality disorder, also known as emotionally unstable personality disorder, which is a lifelong condition where the sufferer has significant difficulties with their thinking and behaviour, including having feelings of chronic emptiness, lack of identity, unstable mood in relationships, a profound fear of abandonment, as well as a tendency to act with violence when confronted with an emotional difficulty in their lives. She was also found out post-traumatic stress disorder linked to her own experience of abuse as a child. Whilst the defence seemed to give credibility to Catherine Knight's claim that she could not remember the offence, the Crown countered this and said that there appeared to be no medical reason why she could not remember this incident and that she was lying. Bolting this case with several points. Firstly, the premeditated nature of the offence. Even if Knight could not remember the killing itself, she had bought the murder weapon with her. Also, the time she spent in her task. Not only killing Price, but she took time to skin him, cut meat from his body, and make meals to try and feed his children. Also, it came out in court that midway through her crimes, Knight had taken Price's bank card, gone to an ATM, and withdrawn money from his account. For a woman who apparently blacked out, I was implying she was merely acting on impulse, with no control, she seems to have been in control enough to find the bank card, remember the PIN number, and draw the money out in order to make gain for herself. Basically it was bullshit. Someone claiming they cannot remember their actions, especially when related to really serious offences, is very, very common, and is 99.9% .9 of the time simply a way to avoid taking responsibility, and also a way to remain in control. Yeah, I killed them, but I'm not telling you why. That'll be my secret. A few days after the trial began in October 2001, to the shock of everyone, Catherine Knight pleaded guilty to murdering John Price. Sources I've read say it's never been made clear why Knight did this, as, to this day, she continues to claim she cannot remember killing him. I personally think it's very simple. The case against her was overwhelming, not only the forensic evidence of the crime scene, but also, it seems, Knight would literally tell everyone who would listen that she would one day kill John Price. She knew she would be convicted, and her only play was to plead guilty in order to get a reduced sentence. However, if this is what she hoped for, she would be sorely disappointed. On the 8th of November 2001, Knight stood before Justice Barry O'Keefe for sentencing. His sentencing remarks spanned 40 pages and took an hour to deliver. During his comments, he reflected on the quote steady hand and grisly methodology Knight demonstrated during the murder, skinning and butchering of Price. He also stated quote, The prisoner has pleaded guilty to a murder which falls into the most serious category of murders. I am satisfied beyond any doubt that such murder was premeditated. I am further satisfied the same way that not only did she plan the murder, but she also enjoyed the horrific acts which followed in its wake as part of a ritual of death and defilement. The things which she did after the death of Mr. Price indicate cognition, volition, calm and skill. I'm satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that her evil actions were the playing out of her resentments arising out of her rejection by Mr. Price, her impending expulsion from Mr. Price's home and his refusal to share with her his assets, particularly his home, which he wanted to retain for his children. I have no doubt that her claim to amnesia forms part of her plan to affect madness in order to escape the consequences of her acts and to provide a convenient basis 
on which to rely to avoid detailed questioning by the police and escape punishment. As I have said, the prisoner showed no mercy whatsoever to Mr Price. The last minutes of his life must have been a time of abject terror for him as they were a time of utter enjoyment for her. At no time during the hearing or prior thereto did the prisoner express any regret for what she had done or any remorse for having done it, not even through the surrogacy of her counsel. Her attitude in that regard is consistent with her general approach to the many acts of violence which she had engaged in against her various partners, namely, they deserved it. In addition, the prisoner's history of violence, together with her flawed personality, caused me to conclude, along with Dr Milton and the other psychiatrists called in this case, that she is without doubt a very dangerous person and likely, if released into the community, to commit further acts of serious violence, including even murder against those who cross her, particularly males. A crime of the kind committed by the prisoner calls for the maximum penalty the law empowers the court to impose. He then sentenced her, stating, quote, An examination of the case referred to by counsel supports the view that I have formed, namely that the only appropriate penalty for the prisoner is life imprisonment, and that parole should never be considered for her. The prisoner should never be released. Catherine Mary Knight, you have pleaded guilty to and been convicted of the murder of John Charles Thomas Price at Aberdeen in the state of New South Wales on or about the 29th of February 2000. In respect to that crime, I sentence you to imprisonment for life. John Price's family erupted into applause. Knight simply smiled, turned and went back to prison to spend the rest of her life behind bars, the first woman in Australia to receive such a sentence. In 2006, Knight appealed her sentence to the New South Wales Court of Appeal, saying that her punishment was too severe. Her appeal was rejected, with the judgment stating, quote, This was an appalling crime, almost beyond contemplation in a civilised society. Catherine Knight is now 67 years old and remains housed at Silverwater Correctional Complex. She appears to have spent the last 21 years relatively quietly, and I cannot find any real record of what she's been up to. Regardless, she will remain behind bars for the rest of her natural life. I wanted to cover this case for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because I think it's a really interesting, but truly horrifying case. Secondly, it's because, as someone pointed out, I've mainly focused on male on female domestic violence cases wanted to cover a case where the roles are reversed. This is an extreme example of this, but it enables me to highlight similarities in the profiles of male and female domestic abuse perpetrators, but also key differences I've found. So, the similarities. Going back to the profile I've gone over several times, both male and female domestic abuse perpetrators seek to gain and maintain control over their intimate partners, often due to their emotional dependence on relationships, fear of abandonment, and low self-esteem. They think that, if given the choice, their partner will inevitably leave them, so they need to do everything they can to make sure this doesn't happen. The best way to do this is to take away their victim's choice by making them feel so low, so afraid, and making their life so empty that, even if they wanted to leave, they would feel unable to. If they show defiance in the relationship, i.e. thinking for themselves, or acting without permission, they get punished which reinforces the control the perpetrator has over them, but also shows them the consequences of defiance. Those with extreme issues with abandonment will often be fixated on their partner cheating on them and will constantly accuse them of infidelity, often without any evidence. This is a reflection of their fear of being abandoned. They'll confront their partner, accuse them of cheating, as I said, without any real evidence, putting their victim in an impossible situation. If they deny what the perpetrators already decided they've done, they will be punished. If they admit it, they will be punished. A terrible situation to be in, I think you'll agree. So, that's the similarities. What are the differences? The differences are subtle, but important, and, in my experience, relate to hatred of certain genders. Let me explain. So often, the most serious perpetrators of male on female domestic abusers have extremely negative views about women, sometimes pure hatred of this gender. This is often linked back to experiences with their mother, including being abandoned by them or not protected by them. For example, 
then being taken into care or not being protected from an abusive partner. The same is true of the most dangerous female perpetrators of domestic abuse, but I found that this hatred of men is far more pronounced and, to a great extent, understandably so. Unfortunately, it's a fact that female children are more likely to be the victim of horrific acts of abuse over a sustained period of time when they are growing up, most usually sexual abuse, and this is often by men they know and should be able to trust such as their father, siblings or other family members. These experiences, which often go on for years and years and are usually unreported, understandably can lead them to have extremely negative views of men, seeing them as perverts, abusers, as well as this type of behaviour destroying their self-esteem, sense of self-worth and identity. With both men and women who hold these negative views of the other gender, their behaviour is often far more extreme, often sadistic, and is not only used to gain and maintain control over their partner, but also, in their mind, to punish them for being male or female, taking out their hatred of their father, mother, etc. on this individual who happens to share the same gender. A good example of the level of violence a man who clearly hates women can display is Peter Tobin, who regularly raped his partners and, in one case, forced a knife into his partner's vagina, causing her such horrific injuries that she could not have children. He also decapitated a pet dog just to cause a girlfriend emotional pain. With Catherine Knight, her horrific upbringing inevitably led her to form a deep hatred of males because of what they did to her. This behaviour also destroyed her self-esteem and meant that she struggled to be alone, so she had to turn to men, who she hated, for comfort. When in the relationships, she sought to control them and punish them, and as each relationship broke down, her hatred increased. Men were evil, but she needed them. This is the horrific contradiction in the mind of the abuser. Due to the violence she experienced and saw in her childhood, this was ingrained in her as a way to solve issues and gain power over people. By the time she met John Price, she had several failed relationships under her belt, all because, in her mind, these men were dicks, and her anger and abandonment issues had got to the point where she was willing to kill and felt completely justified in doing so. You may think that it's just speculation that Knight had a hatred of men, while well, she made no qualms about telling people this, regularly telling her partners and anyone who would listen that, quote, all men are cunts. Unfortunately, Price tried to escape the relationship, to abandon Knight, like so many men had done before, and she couldn't have that. He needed to be punished, but, more than that, he needed to be utterly destroyed. So, she not only killed him, but butchered him, hanging his skin like some sort of trophy, treating him like cattle. Knight trying to feed Price to his own children, I think served two purposes. Firstly, it was to punish them, because she thought they were a barrier to her gaining complete control in the household. Secondly, I think she took great pleasure in imagining John Price being sickened by what she was trying to do to his children. I have some sympathy for Catherine Knight, as I do with anyone who's had an abusive background. However, we all have choices. An abusive childhood does not mean you have the right to abuse others. Catherine Knight made choices and she's now having to live with the consequences of her decisions. I've included contact information for support services for women in previous videos, and I'm sure I'll return to this. But, for this video, I want to focus on support services for men. However, across the board, regardless of your gender identity or your sexual preference, if you're going through this, I need you to hear me. This is not your fault. Some of the bravest and strongest people I've ever met have been those going through domestic abuse or have escaped it. An abuser will try to make you feel worthless, but this isn't true, not at all. You are worth something. You're worth so much more than they've made you feel. With men specifically, I think unfortunately we often have a barrier in our head where, because we are male, we need to be seen as strong and we convince ourselves that these things don't happen to men, but they do. And there are organisations and people who will not judge you and will help you. There are plenty of people like me out there who would stand by your side and support you every step of the way. So in the UK, a great service for men is the Men's Advice Line run by Respect. 
the email address and contact information will be in the description. You can contact them in various ways. You can speak to an advisor between 10am and 5pm Monday to Friday on 0808 801 0327. You can also email them on info at men's advice line or one word dot org dot uk with a response being received sometime between Monday to Friday 9am to 5pm. Also, they have a web chat function, which is available through the website on Wednesday between 10am and 11am, and on a Thursday between 2pm and 4pm. This service is for men who are victims of abuse, both from women as well as same-sex partners. In the US, please contact the National Domestic Abuse Hotline on 1-800-799-SAFE. I've checked, and this service does have trained advisors who can help with men who suffer abuse in relationships. As usual, I love your thoughts on this case, but I also want to ask a favour of everyone. If someone is brave enough to disclose their experiences of domestic abuse in the comments, then I want all of us to be as supportive as possible. Let that person know they're not alone, even if they feel that way. Anyway, take care, and seriously, I mean that, and I'll see you in the next one.